My name is uh, Samir Modi, and I'm the uh, VP of uh, uh, Threat Research at K7. We're based in uh, Chennai in India, and uh, I'm my colleague, uh, Hari, <laughs> you can tell your name. <laughs> but anyway, um, so we're, we're going to talk about, um, a lot of people talk about soft threat intelligence very much from uh, a theoretical perspective of how valuable it can be and um, you know um, all, we talk about the uh, relationships that you can have with different companies and sharing and so on but a lot of it is a little bit soft and theoretical so we thought that okay fine you know, when, when, when Jeanette sent out the, uh, the theme for this uh, practitioner summit uh, she said hey you know we want to talk about the, the community effect so, um, so I thought well why don't we talk about threat, inter threat intelligence from, um, you know, to actually t test out that theory and say, well, okay, fine, if, if people are sharing information, uh, what is the actual effect it would have in the real world? So we decided we'll have, uh, you know, uh, a, a few practical use cases that would demonstrate what is the value of that intelligence. So everyone knows what CTI stands for, right? Um, you'd say that the TI stands for threat intelligence. And a lot of you guys would say, OK, fine, you know, the C stands for cyber. But actually, cyber threat intelligence by itself is not that useful if it doesn't have context, because context actually gives it the meaning that you're looking for. So we could say, OK, um, so the C could also stand for context or contextual. Right, and if you talk about context, and you know you have the the different types of um, um, so if, you know art, uh, well, the characteristics of that threat intelligence, well that has to come from the community because nobody knows about everything, right? So the C could also stand for community. So in a way, we're saying that CTI could actually be all of these things, right? You have a cyber contextual community threat intelligence. Because the community, what it does is it gives, uh, it imbues the, the, the cyber threat center as a context with three things at least, right? There is the vetting, which is very important, which means is it uh, malicious or benign, for example, right? The second is range. So you would have things like, hey, you know, we're going to cover different platforms. We can talk, talk about different geographies. So you can have information from all those different places. And the third is depth, which is for every artifact that you have, you would have um, you know, different aspects of the artifact and linkages between them. Okay? So for us, we are going to talk about how all of these different aspects are actually useful to us in a practical sense. And this, very, for me, is very important. So I, you know, I, I work in a lab. And we actually have to use the information, right? So it is important to describe how this information is used in practical use cases so that it, it actually demonstrates the value. Um, so the previous slide just had a bit of text, right? Uh, but the proof of the pudding is in the eating of it. And we need to be able to apply certain use cases to see how things can work out. So we actually have three use cases, right? Two, the first two of them I'm going to talk about. Uh, one of them is about supervised machine learning. Um, so we're not going to talk too technical into this, but classification and clustering. This is the um, less sexy machine learning. It's not your NLP kind of, you know, LLM, uh, chat GPT type stuff. It's, this is what is called classical machine learning. And uh, this is... This is going to tell us about the importance of having uh, reliable data, you know, data which can actually be used to make these kind of decisions. The second one is multi-layer upstream and downstream detection. This is about using the linkages between reliable data, right? So you have to trust the data is true. And then the context that I talked about in the previous slide, where you can actually see how things are linked, that is going to help us in this stage. And Hari is going to talk later about 
a real world case study about how we nipped the ransomware, so you know, Malox ransomware issue a little bit in the bud, um, well, a bit more than a little bit, but we'll talk about it a little bit later. So first and foremost, we'll talk about the supervised ML. Okay, so we have uh, a quick supervised learning primer, right? How many of in the, in the room know how machine learning works? Okay, so about a third. Uh, the rest of you, I hope uh, I can say what the hell I like, right? And you just believe what I say. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, it's quite interesting to talk about this because AI is kind of a little bit blown out of proportion. Uh, and we'll be talking about that at a um, panel discussion later on uh, this afternoon. Um, but let's think about supervised learning. It's, it's, it's quite important where supervised learning means that you get data which is pre-labeled. Right? And the reason why that is important is that if you were to go back to your school days and you were in a classroom like this, you would have a teacher who knows true and false, good and bad, uh, malware and clean, and would be giving you information about all of those things in a pre-labeled fashion. And then, then you would be able to spot certain patterns in that and learn from that and say, oh, I now know what is good and I know what is bad, right? So let's say you have um, a basket of this kind of beautiful fruit in there, right? Um, and let's say these are different types of stuff, okay? Um, in our example, we're going to focus on apple and orange because these are diametrically opposite, right? And in our use case over the next few slides, the apple is going to be bad, the evil, because of the Garden of Eden, right, and, and Adam. And the orange is going to be good, right? And you can see from what we have here that something is pre-labeled. So we're going to avoid the rest of the, uh, the, the rest of the fruit, which is maybe your PUAs and so on. And we're going to focus on the apples and the oranges. And you will see that the apple and orange has got certain features, right? The features like, okay, you know, there's a shape, there's a color, there is uh, a little bit of stem sticking out, uh, and the orange is, you know, uh, compl completely spherical, and it has a different color, and so on. And if you go even further inside the fruit, then there'll be other characteristics or what we call features. So the issue is this: there are lots of different things that look like apples, and there are a lot of different versions of apples. They come from uh, different places, they, they might have different colors, but they're still apples, right? So what this is saying is that, and we're going to be looking at real data shortly, right? This is saying that a lot of different things that look different are still malware, right? And the same way there are lots of different things that look different that are clean. And it's important for us to know what is malware and what is clean, because only after that can we use the information in a way where we can spot the patterns and say, hey, if I have all of these characteristics in this order, we can say this is malware or this is clean, right? It's a bit simplified, but that's essentially what is going on. What we don't want is this. We don't want to have an orange amongst apples because then you confuse the model, right? And you just put yourself in the same position. If you're back at school and you had, um, you know, um, your teacher telling you that, hey, this is how you say that something is good, and then something that bad looks like something that's good, then you're going to get pretty confused, right? So it could lead to false positives. So here's some real data, right? Um, the first set on the top, these are all apples, right? These are all URLs which are malicious that we got from uh, Magalan. So that is uh, the CTA's threat intelligence um, uh, sharing platform. And unfortunately, uh, Magellan does not cover clean stuff, but the bottom set is the, that's something we can actually do in the future maybe. Uh, there's the clean stuff that comes from our own whitelisted uh, URLs. So you can see that um, there are whole different types of like, you know, URLs which can be malicious and uh, uh, the same different type of URLs that can be clean. I'm not gonna go into the details of which type of model that you're going to use um, in terms of machine learning. But it helps that 
you can trust where the data comes from and you can assign a label to it saying all of these are apples and all of these are oranges and then you can then sort of, you know, work out, okay, which characteristics or features I'm going to take from uh, the URLs that can be fed into uh, a model, and then the model can make a decision on, hey, is this an apple or this, is this an orange? Are you guys with me so far? Yeah? Good. So, we get this for we can use in back, our backend URL classification. We don't actually have a machine called FooScan, right? But I thought it was quite a cool concept. Right? So you have a, a, a mass amount of fruit or URLs that get, can get fed into a, a machine, and the machine is then using a model that is going to be able to decide based on certain features whether it is, uh, I mean, in this case, these look like some, something is not an apple and orange, but hey, I couldn't get one for apples and oranges. So it, you, you get the picture, right? Um, but yeah, so our, it's extremely useful for us to have reliable data from which you can extract features which will then be used in the model, okay? So that is for URLs. But we can also use the same kind of concept for clustering. These are also, um, these are now Windows file paths that we have got from Magalan, and I did this myself, right? You went on the, the Magalan portal and got a bit of data. And um, you can look at these and say, hey, they look like they're quite disparate, but are there any patterns that emerge between, b within these? And you can see that, hey, okay, fine. You know, there are um, five parts that have uh, the temp directory involved, right? So there is a bit of a pattern here. And if you go to the next directory, it's, um, you can see that three of them have got the same sort of, you know, directory that follows that. One of them drops out because it doesn't have another directory, this one over here. And this one is a different directory. So, but three of them are still looking the same. On the third so if, you know, go, so to speak, you'll see that there is, uh, you know, they're not the same file name in the path, but they look similar because you have a similar set of you know, characters, you have a similar set of uppercase and lowercase and so on. And so we can actually say this is part of the same family. Right? Now, why is that useful? Um, when you're able to use certain artifacts, so these are going to be linked to certain samples because that's how threat intelligence works. You have a lot of context. You're going to be able to get different samples, different hashes that had the same kind of file behavior. And we can then feed that into a different system that is going to be able to automatically link them together and write generic um, you know, detections for them, right? So this is pretty handy, it's pretty useful. And this is all automated, by the way, right? So for all of these automations to work, and last year's uh, tips track, I talked about you know, the, uh, the importance of having reliable data in, uh, in an automated fashion. This is, doing, this is actually talking about how we're actually gonna use that data. So that's that. And the next use case that we have here is about uh, upstream and downstream detection. So the next slide, this slide is actually similar for, uh, you know, to the one from last year. This is like a typical threat life cycle. Um, you, know, you, you, you know the, the usual pattern, right? You'd click on a link, you might get a file on the disk, and then the, the, the file would execute, and it'll do something. And you might think of each one of these different events as disparate and separate from each other, but they're not, especially if you think about threat intelligence. So the point here is that you might not have enough evidence at any one of these bits, so if, you know, any one of these events to actually decide that I want to detect this, this file, this artifact. But they're actually linked together, right? Because we know that if you have, uh, you know, reliable linked threat intelligence, you would know that, okay, this URL is actually related to this file, and this file behaved like this, so you're actually going to be able to link a URL to behavior downstream of that, and that can be used uh, to make a more reliable decision. So we call that smart tips, where we're going to be able to have sufficient information at the point at which the file does something on, on, on the device, which is linked to where it came from. Right? So if you think about what I talked about earlier, about you know, the, the use of uh, machine learning for URL classification, 
that can actually be used in the same way within this technology to actually decide whether you want to block that or not. The next thing we have here is what we call AIRS, which is the Adaptive Immune Response System. Here we are going to use a threat intelligence, so we call it ETI, Ecosystem Threat Intelligence, right? So it is the, um, is powered by threat intelligence where we are going to have a perimeter, right? We have a, a kind of, you know, environment which has lots of different devices and uh, you can have a particular type of threat event that comes and it will come with certain features and we're going to be able to use um, a couple of things. First of all, we want, you know, the ETI sort of database is going to have reliable data with linkages again and you're going to be able to send back antibodies. So this is supposed to work a little bit like a human body where not everybody has the same, uh, you know, response to an infection. And so you can tailor make, uh, um, you know, um, the response based on whose body it is. So here we would have um, the use of the linkages again, where you could have a certain threat event that happened, let's say, as a behavior. So there was a, a HIPS detection of some sort, which is linked to a hash. And that can go back to the DB saying, hey, I know this hash is actually related to this type of URL. And then you can actually have, uh, you know, a generic protection that can be automatically created across various layers based on the linkages between them. So these are the, um, uh, the kind of use cases that we already have, uh, you know, either we've implemented or we've thought about or we're about to implement. And um, they are heavily based on the importance of threat intelligence, um, where we have the real, you know, we have reliable data, and we have got uh, linkages between the data. And now my colleague is going to talk about the, the, the third one, which is the Malux ransomware case. We talk about timely data, because as Hari will explain shortly, if this is you know critical in making sure that you can uh, nip something in the bud. So let me hand over to, to Hari. Thank you, Mir. So I'm going to now quickly walk you all through the birth of what we have christened as the BIP, or simply BIP, which was born out of our efforts to nip the malax issue in the bud. Towards the end of last year and the beginning of this year, uh, we saw a lot of our enterprise customer networks falling victim to this uh, Malax group. And as you can see from this graph, uh, we were seeing multiple incidents pretty much every week. And the, the, the targets were across industry victors. They were ranging from educational institutions to manufacturing units to healthcare organizations and just about everything in between. So, and as you can imagine, this was a pretty hectic time for the team back home, which is a pretty small one, by the way. So we started thinking if and how we could beat this problem in a different manner. This year, as most of you know, would know, is the typical flow of a malox attack. And we started by mapping the you know, incidence response observations we had with the known TDPs employed by this group. And we started a pattern emerging. And it was almost as if an SOP was being followed. <clears throat> In most of the, uh, so, sorry, in, in all the cases we saw during that time, the initial uh, breach vector was SQL brute forcing. And this was followed by attempts at escalation privilege. And once these two were achieved, is when the bad guys greed kicked in and we got the break we were looking for. Instead of directly going in for the kill, they started detonating different other payloads before unleashing the actual final ransomware payload. Uh, in fact, uh, in the cases we saw, we saw only those, uh, we saw only coin, different coin miners and mimicats being detonated, but we looked up stuff on CTS Megalan for uh, information that's available from the community, and we saw that there were, uh, you know, samples of uh, purple rat, Remcos, and uh, purple, uh, purple fox, Remcos, and all that that were also related to this. And there were also a couple of instances where we got to know from the data available on Magellan that the IPs that we saw that were used for the brute forcing were known blacklisted IPs. And we also got other hashes that were related to those IPs. So all this happened to be useful information and ammunition that came to what came later on. So we realized that 
basically we had at least two to three days of lead time uh, between uh, the initial breach and the final boom. And in fact, interestingly, there were even a couple of cases where the bad guys had been within the enterprise network for more than a month before they actually unleashed this uh, malloc sample. So we did realize that we had quite a bit of time to nip this in the bud. And so we worked on it a bit, we came up with a plan, but we first wanted to establish the efficacy of what we had in mind. So we started by diligently sifting through our uh, telemetry data uh, using predefined rule sets. And uh, what we were looking for were uh, you know, instances of such breach terms and TDPs that were happening within our enterprise customer networks that had transpired within the last 24 to 48 hours. And once we had that, we had a small problem. We, uh, the, the telemetry data did not contain information that directly identified the customers. So we had to go back to our product engineering team so who helped us with marrying the data we had with the product registration framework and they got us the contact details, who the actual customer is and stuff like that. And with that, we were in a position to start sending out notifications to the network administrators of those enterprises. Our notifications obviously included stuff like what we had observed and you know what they could potentially do to mitigate what was happening on the network. But we also emphasized on the fact that they were well on their way to becoming victims of this ransomware group because over the years we have realized that that is the best way of getting an immediate reaction from customers. And somewhere along this process, we ended up naming this project as Breach Intelligence Protection. So once we had streamlined our BIP operations, the number of malox incidents we saw were few and far between. And in fact, even the ones we did see were almost always because the customer had failed to react to our notifications in time. And based on our success with the malox issue, we wanted to have similar early warning systems for other widespread campaigns, campaigns in the future. So, but at the same time, we do realize that not all the bad guys are going to be as accommodating as the guys behind Malox. So we are not going to have those you know, few days time between the breach and the boom. So what we're now working on is an end-to-end -end automated system that's going to do all of this stuff for us, which is all the way from identifying potential breaches based on rule sets and all the way down to actually sending those notifications to the customer in as near real time as possible. Thank you.